all you ASP subscribers out there, and visitors to this site, hopefully you'll see some of the other ASP productions. This is a collection of some fairly common 1917 and P13 bayonets that are part of my collection. That was the very first item I ever collected at the military. We start off at this end with the P13 bayonets, okay? This is a Winchester, and this is the markings on it, and they were being made in America. There were some earlier ones that are very rare that were made in England by Wilkinson, but you rarely see them. And you can see the markings, and another one here is another P-13 bayonet. One is Remington, and one is Winchester. Again, Remington has a little circle that says Remington, and Winchester has the W. And if you can zero in on them, I can flip these over and see the markings. And you can see it's sort of a two-tone. It's blued on the Ricasso and sort of a dull finish going there. Now, when the United States entered World War I, there was a shortage of firearms, rifles. And a decision was made that we would adapt the P-13, modify it to use our ammunition. And we were going to keep their bayonets. So the first problem we faced was the scabbard. This is the British scabbard. It hooks on to a web belt loop. And we had hooks called the 1910 hooks. So we developed our own scabbard. And I want to show you this. This is called the first model scabbard. And it had mostly leather and it had the hooks. And that presented a problem in no time at all. Because, as I will show you here, this was the result in most cases. It broke. It was a bad design. Now, Remington told our government, listen, we have a half million bayonets already in stock. Do you want to buy them? Because the British don't need them. So the first 500,000 or so bayonets are actually British bayonets that are then overmarked. They crossed out either by peening, like on this one, or by slashing and adding a U.S., either on the bottom of the Ricasso or on the side. And in this way, we could start supplying our soldiers with bayonets right away. So a half a million of these were made, and even in the Army handbooks it tells them you're going to find bayonets that were made from a pretty previous British, or, uh, British previous contract, and as a collector, there's something to look for. They're going to have the British markings removed, either peened or slashed, and then U.S. added. And so that is a variation. And we see the first type of scabbard, okay? Again, with the leather. This, again, did not work well. So, they started producing bayonets with a new scabbard, which, would, which was a much better design. This is called the second model scabbard. And over here, we have a Remington. And at first, we just copied the British design totally. So there's no little hole here, which I'm going to explain later. We just copied the British design. All right, and you see the markings. Okay. Well, after a while, we decided to improve on it. And this is the first improved one. They drilled the hole right there so you could help clean out the guideway for the, uh, for the bayonet because you got dirt and crud in here. It was hard to clean out. So we added a hole for that purpose. This particular bayonet cost me $2.95 plus 35 cents postage and handling from P&S Sales, Tulsa, Oklahoma, when I was 12 years old. So I sent away for it, and this is the first item in my collection of military is this particular bayonet. So I always, it's got sentimental value. Now at that time, the bayonet with postage and handling came out to $3 and almost 50 cents. The rifle you could buy for $25 or $35. So the bayonet was one-tenth the value of the rifle. Nowadays, the rifles go for $700 to $800, and the bayonets go for $200 to $300. <laughs> so the bayonet was a, a better investment. Now, in 1918, Remington started to date them, 1918, and the government told them to stop because they just wanted everything to be marked 1917. They said, we don't want the year of manufacture, we want the model of the bayonet. And the bayonet model is the 1917 bayonet. So for a while, they marked them 1918, and then they stopped. And this one here is a nice two-tone that I just bought five days ago. All right. Next to it is the one that cost you a lot more money. That's your Winchester. And that's because people want Winchesters. 
but they're made the same style. You can see this one here, it's faded a lot. The blue under Ricasso. Now next to it is another Winchester. This one here has some parkerization on it. And the scabbard is different. The scabbard is the World War II scabbard, plastic scabbard for the Pacific Campaign. And what they did is they went to the Beckwith Company. And the Beckwith Company took the scabbard that they used for the 1903 and they added a longer throat. So you can see the marking on it. All right. Got it. All right. Now, Vietnam comes along and it's a shortage of bayonets. So they had to go out and produce them again. For the, for the guns. So they went to General Cutlery and to Canada and they produced these. And they had to produce new scabbards, which are on the same design as the World War II scabbard. But these are parkerized, they're not as finely made as the ones that were originally made. Now, somewhere along the line, some bureaucrat decided he was going to eliminate drive by stabbings. And, or cocaine use, you know, you could put a lot of good drugs right into that blood groove, man, and really get a high. So they started destroying these bayonets. And years ago, the Sarco Company in New Jersey was able to get a whole bunch of these. They were cut. They then took blades from Mark III Enfield bayonets, combined the cross guard and the grips, and they created a pseudo-Vietnam era 1917 bayonet. And about the only way you can look, figure it out is the back here. You can see the originals are squared. When you take an older bayonet, British or American, it's rounded. So if you get one with plastic grips, right, and it's rounded, it's one of the Sarko specials, which again, at that time you couldn't get an original one because like I said, some bureaucrat decided they had to be destroyed. Now, during World War II, somebody's got damaged or whatever, so they had to replace the grips. So if you get this light wood, which is found on this blued, now, when they recondition the bayonets, they sometimes blued the entire blade, or they parkerize the blade. So these are examples of probably World War II reconditioned, repaired bayonets. And originally they were that two-tone, and then refinishing, re-bluing. Now, for sources of information, you got U.S. Enfield by Skitterton, this book, the military handbook, this. There's also, if you're in a hurry, go on the internet and get Cunningham, Gary Cunningham's Bayonet Points. This will give you a lot of information. And this is the United States Model of 1917, a good book. And this book here is a guide to the American Enfield and they have a section on bayonets. Let me open it up. All the markings, everything else. Now, as we pan this table, we are going to see some exotic and rare bayonets, which will be explained maybe in a future video. But as you come along here, you can see these different exotic ones. And when you get to the end, very important, make a copy of this card. Okay, good. So answer, yes, thank you. Uh, something I've not this is the ultimate guide. If you're going to collect U.S. bayonets, Enfield bayonets, this is the ultimate guide. Okay, we thank you very much for your attention and hope this interests you in collecting 1917 bayonets. Again, a very affordable, collectible, unless you look for the super duper rare type. And if you want to know what they look like, get this book. Bingo. It's probably worthwhile. <laughs>